Welcome to this, the final vodcast in the vodcast on electricity and magnetism. We're looking at the um, magnetic fields of electric currents uh, section and looking at magnetic fields and charges in a magnetic field and uh, the charges that, um, how charges behave inside a magnetic field and the magnetic field that is created when charges move. So we're clearing up all of the understandings, applications and skills and we're using those equations from the data booklet. So this diagram shows you a side-on view of a conductor, a wire or any other conductor, with a conventional electrical current travelling from left to right. That's conventional current, by the way. So the, um, the, the electrons, if it is electrons, might be travelling in the opposite direction. If you want to simulate what the field will be, use your right-hand rule. And... <coughs> excuse me and um, curl your fingers of your right hand around the conductor and those fingers will show you the direction in which the magnetic field lines will be curved. Don't forget the magnetic field line direction means if you put a small compass at that point in the field what direction will the north seeking pole stick in. That's fine for a, a side on view but if we want a front back view we need to use a certain symbology um, I think this symbology to me looks like it's um, based on a crosshead or sort of Phillips uh, screw or possibly an arrow. Um, in the, if you have a, a current going into the screen, into the page, or a field that goes into the screen or the page, you use a cross or a circle with a cross inside, which looks like a crosshead screw going away from you, pointing away from you, or an arrow pointing away from you. You can see the fletching. Um, conversely, if a current is coming from a wire out towards you, or a field is coming out towards you, you have a circle with a dot in it or just a dot. Um, so a cross field or a dot field is also used to refer to a magnetic or electrical fields where the field lines are pointing away from you um, or, or towards you. Yep. So here we have that same piece of wire from the first slide, but instead of seeing the, same, uh, the, the, the side view we're seeing on the left hand side where the current is coming out and on the right hand side the current going in. Again, if you take your thumb of your right hand and you curl your fingers and then put the thumb pointing towards you, like you're going to suck your thumb, you'll see that the fingers curl around pointing in the direction of the arrows. And similarly with the current in, if you stick your thumb pointing away from you with your right hand side and then the fingers will curl the other way around. Another thing to note, it's not very obvious maybe from this diagram, is that the field density is closer the closer you are to the current. In other words, those lines should be closer together. Now that field is created when a wire is just in isolation. It's just sitting there while carrying current. No other noticeable magnetic fields around. I mean, there's always the Earth's magnetic field, but it's not, very, not a very strong field. Uh, if, however, you can place a current carrying conductor inside a pre-existing magnetic field that's of equal or, or, or of a greater strength, um, then you will have an effect. So on the left-hand side here, you can see there's an external magnet which has a uh, north pole at the top and a south pole at the bottom. So it's not very clear, but those arrows are pointing down towards the south pole. And if we place a, a current carrying conductor going into the screen, then it will create the circular magnetic field that we can see. Now, magnetic field lines never cross, so there you're just sort of seeing them separately. But the actual magnetic field that will be created is the one on the right. Because on the right-hand side, the external field is pointing from north to south, and the... Uh, cross section the field due to wire is pointing north to the south so those two lines reinforce each other they, they make each other stronger but on the left hand side as we're looking at it they oppose the external field is going from north to south the internal field is going from in this um, in the opposite direction on the left hand side of the current carrying conductor which leads to the creation of a neutral point near to the conductor where you have strong dense field lines on the other side which exerts a force on the wire. So the wire will experience a force. Newton's third law, by the way, 
the magnets will experience a force in the other direction but we're going to make the assumption here that the wire is free to move or at least more flexible whereas the big thick magnets are, are more fixed in place so what direction will that force be experienced in well here we can use the other hand your Fleming's left hand rule sir stick your left hand out and make your thumb, your first finger and your second finger perpendicular to each other as shown as best we can on the diagram. And the thumb represents the force on the wire. The first finger represents the direction of the magnetic field and the second finger the direction of current. Remember this is conventional current, not the direction any particular charge carriers are going, but the, the assumed positive charge carriers, even if it's really electrons, that are carrying the current will travel in the direction of conventional current. So if you do this, if you align your second finger with the direction of current, if you align your first finger with the direction of a the field, then your thumb will give you the direction of thrust. Or vice versa. You know, if you know the direction of a thrust, the direction of a field, you can work out what direction the current must be traveling. Here's the same situation, just a slightly different diagram, which maybe shows it a little bit clearly, more clearly. Um, so there's a magnet on the left hand side, north pole, right hand side of the south pole. So the field line, first finger is pointing from north to south because that's always the direction that you go in. The uh, wire has a arrow indicating the direction of a conventional current, that's the second finger. So the thumb gives the thrust or the kinetic direction as it's labelled here, which will be up. That gives you the direction, but what about the force? Well, the force depends on depends on how strong the external magnetic field is, which is also known as the magnetic flux density in units of Tesla, as we talked about before. Uh, it depends on the size of a current in the wire, which again makes sense. The bigger the current, the bigger you'd expect the force to be. So that's I and L. L is the length of the wire inside the magnetic field. Okay, so F equals Bill. But that's not quite the whole story because that only really applies to its maximum effect if the current direction and the field direction, magnetic field direction, are at right angles. Sine theta, 90 degrees, right angles. So sine theta equals 1, so F equals Bill in that case. However, is as the magnetic field direction and the current carrying direction become more aligned that force will get weaker until if they are parallel then sine theta sine zero will be zero and uh, and there will be no force whatsoever that's what happens for a complete wire but the force on the wire is actually due to all of the tiny forces on all of the charge carriers in the wire um, a more complicated maybe situation happens when you have a single particle charge carrying particle rather than a wire because the wire constrains the particles they can only move the current can only actually flow in the direction of wire but if we have a single charge it can travel more freely so how we have a, a dot field a b dot field so it's coming out uh yeah that's right out of the screen uh, we have the positive charge and it's moving from left to right as indicated by the green arrow now you can do Fleming's left hand rule here this is a positive charge so you can still use the direction it's traveling as the direction of current so your right hand rule the second finger is the current is the same as the V the green arrow so left to right the B direction given by the first finger is out of the screen so twist your left hand until your first finger is pointing back towards you your right uh, second finger is going from left to right and now you'll see that the force is directing downwards. Assuming that the positive particle entered um, from the left hand side, it will be pushed down. But that will of course change the velocity vector. If it changes the velocity vector, as you can sort of see at the bottom here, it will just push it round so that the uh, force vector will still change. And what can end up happening is that you will have, if you have a uniform field, 
then your force, your charge particle, will, will just travel round and round. If that's the field at the bottom shown on an electron, it looks the same as the direction in, of the positive charge in the previous, but that's because that was a field that was coming out, whereas this field is going in. So your second, your first finger should now go into the page. Your second finger uh, can go from right to left. Because it's an electron, if you do use your Fleming's left-hand rule, you have to do it backwards for electrons. So the direction of current is opposite the direction of the flow. Alternatively, you can use your right hand, but frankly, I think that gets more confusing, but it's your choice. Top of the diagram there, by the way, goes back to showing the force on a, on a wire, and it play, explains that in most cases, uh, it's electrons that are traveling and moving. So that's why the direction will be in that direction. For the F equals bill applied for um, for a wire, for a charged particle, we have a variant F equals BQV. VIB, for some reason, prefers F equals QVB. Uh, so the strength of the magnetic field di directly affects the, the force. Um, Q is the charge on the particle, unsurprisingly also directly aff affects the force, double the charge, double the force. And V is the velocity. Okay, which might be a bit less of us um, expected, but the greater the velocity, the greater the rate of change, the rate of change of flux, then the greater the um, the greater the force again. So F equals B Q V or Q V B. But again, actually, this does depend on on the angle between the velocity vector of the charged particle and the field lines of the B field. Uh, so again, we throw the sine theta in there. If they're perpendicular, sine theta equals 1, and you have the maximum F equals BQB. If they're in parallel, then sine theta will give you 0, and there will actually be no force on the particle. We can actually change this equation to F equals BEV, B equals EV sine theta, if we're talking about electrons or, for that matter, protons, but any particle with an elementary charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Examples of this in use, by the way, we'll, we'll come back to this picture later in topic seven. This is an example of a radiation detection method called a cloud chamber, where charged particles create thin lines of cloud, effectively, in a chamber full of supersaturated water vapour. You'll notice there's lots of curves and curls and spirals, and those are caused because there is a magnetic field applied across this, and relatively low move, uh, low speed particles uh, or light or heavy particles will curve in these circles. The direction of the curve is determined by the charge of the particle and the radius of the curve is determined by the uh, mass of the particle and the, um, the forces on it. Um, these form spirals, by the way, because as they're moving, if they're relatively low, low velocity, then they're going to be impacting other particles and they lose energy, so they travel slower, so they travel tighter, so they spiral down. A little bit of an aside here. Um, the def definition of the ampere used to be the amount of current, one amp, required to maintain a force of 2 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons per meter between two infinitely, not in practice, but, you know, close enough, long parallel wires of negligible cross-section held one meter apart. So this was again because you had two electric currents and if you have two parallel currents in two parallel wires they will both experience a force because their two B fields interact. Um, the they B fields will cancel out between the wires and therefore the wires will experience an external force pushing them in. Okay, That actually is no longer the definition of an amp. They changed the definition on, I think it was the 20th of May, 2019, officially. Okay. And so the amp is now actually defined in terms of coulombs, because now we have uh, a, hmm, a chosen definite value for the elementary charge, accurate to one, one billionth of a, a coulomb, I guess. Um, we're expressing unit coulombs equal to the uh, amp seconds, um, because one coulomb is uh, the charge that flows when a current of one amp flows for one second. Again, that's that's not. Well, hopefully, you'll remember all that from earlier in the unit. 
Um, but yes, that's the modern definition of an amp. But the old definition did used to be in terms of this, this force between wires. One final thing before we finish. Uh, if you take a, a metal bar a conductor and it travels through a field as shown, so it's moving down in this case B, there's a B field that's going into the page. Then if you use Fleming's left hand rule, well right hand rule I guess if it's an electron or left hand rule, but remember you're doing it backwards, then you'll find that all the electrons get pushed to one end of the, of the cable. The protons are in, in the nucleus of the atoms and they're big and heavy to move, so it's normally the electrons that do the moving. And if you attach, you know, what the, the net effect of this is the electrons will get shoved to one end of the, the conductor and that forms a low potential, leaving positive at the other end of a high potential. And if you would put a cable between them somehow, you would find you could get a flowing current, you've basically created an electrical circuit just by dropping a metal bar in a B field. And that's important. You've induced an EMF. And this is a really, really significant piece of technology because this is how almost all generators work. They work by somehow moving conductors inside a magnetic field, which pushes the electrons around, which sets up a potential difference, which means that you now have an induced EMF. You can get electricity to flow by merely moving somehow, by spinning it with your hand or using a wheel or the wind or water pressure, whatever, in order to turn a conductor inside a magnetic field. High level students will learn a lot more about this in the next topic. Those are our understandings. Have a quick read through, pause the video if you need to. And, uh, but we should have covered all of those. Obviously you now need to go and do some questions and practice your understanding. Thank you very much for your attention.